This message comes from NPR sponsor, Discover. If you use debit over credit, get Discover Cashback Debit, a checking account that rewards with cash back on everyday purchases. See terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank, member FDIC. Hey, hey, I'm Brittany Luce, and you're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR, a show where we talk about what's going on in our culture and why it doesn't happen by accident. And today, an interview I feel like I have been preparing my whole life for. Ms. Barbara Streisand. Welcome to It's Been a Minute. It is a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I cannot even front. I am a Barbara fangirl. So I was beyond thrilled to sit down with her to talk about her new memoir called My Name is Barbara. Now, Miss Streisand is one of the original multi-hyphenates. She really does it all and has every letter of EGOT to prove it. And even though most people know her first and foremost for her beautiful and singular voice. Don't bring around a cloud to rain on my parade. Singing isn't really her passion. I didn't start out to be a singer. I just desperately wanted to be an actress and I couldn't get a job. She parlayed her singing stardom into an acting career with iconic movies like Funny Girl and The Way We Were. And then that turned into a desire to get behind the camera and direct for films like Yentl and The Prince of Tides. I love the mechanisms of making films. What are the camera moves? What character do I focus on at this moment and at that moment? How do I indicate this song? How does it photograph? I mean, I love having lots to concentrate on. That hunger to act on her vision and her desire for artistic control is what drives everything Barbara has done. But she says every bit of that control was hard won. You know, you can't dress like that or you can't sing songs like that or you should become more commercial so that you would sell more records or whatever. I just never understood it. Barbara is even more impressive when you look at the timing of it all. She founded her first production company years before American women could even open up a credit card without their husband. I chatted with the Miss Streisand about her memoir, her incredible life, and what it meant to take the reins. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Discover. Like using debit over credit? Think it's time to also get rewarded? Well, now you can with Discover Cashback Debit. It's a checking account that rewards everyone with cash back on everyday purchases, plus all the things you've been contemplating. So that concert, no brainer. Self-care, yes, please. Do what you love and get cash back while you're doing it. Check out eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank, member FDIC. This message comes from NPR sponsor Netflix, presenting All the Light We Cannot See. Directed by Sean Levy and starring Hugh Laurie and Mark Ruffalo, this four-part limited series, based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, is a breathtaking tale of hope, human connection, and resilience. It follows Marie Lore and Werner's journey through World War II, where their paths collide in the pursuit of light amidst darkness. Watch All the Light We Cannot See, now only on Netflix. Hey, it's B.A. Parker from Code Switch, the race and identity podcast from NPR. I'm one of thousands of NPR network voices and more than 200 local newsrooms across the country. The NPR Network. What you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org slash network. Your memoir, My Name is Barbara, is coming out. But something I noticed grabbed me as soon as I opened up like the, yeah. the, the prologue. The first right. page of your book details some of the harshest things your critics have said about you over the years. And it, was, <laughs> it wasn't where I was expecting the book would start. And uh-huh. a few pages later, you say, I'm scared that after six decades of people making up stories about me, mm-hmm. I'm going to tell the truth and nobody is going to believe it. What yeah. about the real you did you think people would find so unbelievable? I mean, I never read the books about me. When I was doing this book, I had to hire a researcher to look me up because I just never read those things. But I was told about 
the um, stories about me, you know, when I tried to say early in my career, well, that's not true. Mm. It didn't matter. The myths keep getting perpetuated. You say these myths, what kind of myths are we talking about? What were these stories that were out there about you that were untrue? Something about putting petals that I, the petals had to follow me, you know, <laughs> like making me into a diva. I'm not a diva. You know what I mean? I'm from mm. Brooklyn. Divas, I don't think come from Brooklyn. <laughs> Everybody knows your voice, of course. And I mean, you know, we're thinking about your music career. We're talking over 50 albums. And you are known as one of the greatest performers of all time. But I also think of you as one of the greatest image makers of all time. And I think that your work as a director really speaks to that. And that's what I really want to focus on today. I mean, your directing career officially began in 1983 with Yantol, but mm -hmm. you seem to have a director's mind from the beginning mm -hmm. of your career as it's unfolding in your book. Yeah. What was the moment that made you realize that your opinions could shape an overall project for the better? Wow. That's a lovely thing to say about me, but it is true, I think. I just was always visualizing things in my head when I first had to, you know, make a living by singing. When I got the job on stage and I can get it for you wholesale, my first Broadway show, mm -hmm. and I did an audition and I told them I want to sit in a chair right. because, first of all, I'm nervous. And being nervous, I'd like to sit in a chair. But second of all, that's how I imagined her, the character, Miss Marmelstein, singing her song. Nobody calls me, hey baby doll. Miss Marmelstein. Or oh, honey dear. Miss Marmelstein. Or oh, sweetie pie. She was a secretary, right? She was a secretary. Secretarial chairs have wheels, so it would be funny I knew to roll around in that chair. And then as soon as we start rehearsals, they say, well, now we're going to stage it. Stage it how? And it was <laughs> with lots of people on the stage walking back and forth with papers in their hands. It just didn't feel right. Do mm -hmm. you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. One was staged and felt uncomfortable. The other way felt honest that that song would come from her sitting in what she's comfortable in. Hmm, hmm. It's like not just thinking about the song that you had to sing or thinking about that detail about the character, like her profession right. as just a detail, thinking right. about how to bring all of those things together to make the story truer. Exactly. <laughs> it just felt right. But I want to fast forward from mm -hmm. this point where you're earlier in your career and you are realizing that you can visualize a piece in full. And I want to talk about your directorial debut. Mm -hmm. Yentl was your dream project. And we all know mm -hmm. that it went on to be a huge success, but it took over a decade to get made, partially because... 15 years, yeah. 15 years. Yes, I mean, sorry. that's no cakewalk. Yeah. And there were so many points, as you point out in the book, where you could have given up. Some people told you that you should have given up, mm -hmm. but you didn't. Mm -hmm. and, and so we all know it now to be this huge success. But it took so long to get made. And part of that was because some of the executives who passed on this project mm -hmm. told you that it was too Jewish of a story to be marketable, mm -hmm. even if the executives themselves were Jewish. You know, looking mm -hmm. back, what do you think of that comment, too Jewish? What do you think that comment really meant? And what did you think of it at the time? Well, the Jewish population then and now was very small in terms of the United States population or the world population. Hmm. After World War II, especially, the dislike, the hatred, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. even those, I just read the, I can't tell you, the real names of the heads of studios, you know, from Warner Brothers. Hmm. They all had to change their name to be sort of less Jewish, you know? To be like more anglicized or American. Yes, sounding. exactly, exactly. So I think they were afraid to be that, the other, the one that was hounded in Europe, you know, mm. trying to raise themselves up, become more anglicized, yeah. The way you're describing it now, you sound like you have an understanding about it. But I wonder, was it 
was it infuriating to you at the time? Like, were you ever insulted? Or did you have sort of the same even handedness in thinking about it where you could, you were disappointed that you couldn't get your project made, but you had some insight as to where they were coming from? How did you see it then? Yeah, I think so. I mean, again, when I went to the studios with this little short story, Yentl the Yeshiva Boy, <laughs> my agent, when I found out, he never told me about that offer to do something with that story. Mm. I asked, why wouldn't you tell me what was offered to me? Well, he says, you know, you just played a Jewish girl in Funny Girl, and so you don't want to play an, a Jewish boy, do you? Mm. You know, that kind of thing. It was like, but that's not for you to tell me. Right. The story interested me because it was about gender inequality, that a woman couldn't study. You know what that feeling is, You to be you. You became what you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I became what I wanted to be, but I don't want somebody telling me what I can't be. It's like some of the things that you saw Yentl up against in her life, in the story. You could also yeah. see some of those same forces at work in your own life with people telling you, no. Yeah. I recently rewatched it in preparing to talk to you today. Mm -hmm. And I was reminded how beautiful a film it is, but also how sophisticated the gender commentary in the film is and how ahead of mm. its time it was. The ending, of course, is so radical because mm -hmm. Yentl chooses the intellectual connection and stimulation over conventional romance, which, I mean, mm -hmm. it felt transgressive for me to watch it <laughs> when I rewatched it a couple mm -hmm. days ago. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine it felt that way 40 years, 40 years ago. But, mm -hmm. you know, something I also noticed this time around when I was watching the film was how in passing as a man, Yentl is sometimes seduced by all the trappings that come along with a man's life, specifically mm -hmm. a dutiful wife in a beautiful home without having to do the cooking and the cleaning and the decorating <laughs> right. and all of that. That's right. More noodles? They're your favorite. How do you know? You told me last week at dinner. I was watching it. Yeah. And I was thinking, <laughs> this movie is still what the girls need today. Like, this movie <laughs> is still, like, it's still so relevant. We haven't progressed in all those years. Oh yeah. I mean, could you have imagined that the gender commentary in Yentl would still be so relevant in 2023? I didn't imagine that. I mean, I was just being in the moment, you know. It just shows you how slow it's taken, how many years it's taken to be a woman with opinions and have that be okay now. Coming up, Barbara Streisand on what it means to have control over her work and her anxiety over her legacy. Stick around. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Neutral. Neutral offers organic, pasture-raised milk that is carbon neutral certified. They're on a mission to reduce the carbon footprint of agriculture by partnering with family farms across the country to implement carbon reduction projects. To learn more about how Neutral makes carbon neutral certified milk a reality, not by 2030 or 2050, but today, visit eatneutral.com. Or find Neutral Milk nationwide at Whole Foods Market, Sprouts, and other natural retailers. Hi, it's Robin Young from NPR's Here and Now. I'm one of thousands of NPR network voices coming to you from over 200 local newsrooms across the country. We bring all Americans closer together through free and independent journalism, music, politics, culture, so much more. The NPR network, what you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org slash network. Hey, it's Camila Kashani from NPR StoryCorps podcast. I'm one of thousands of NPR network voices coming to you from over 200 local newsrooms across the country. We bring all Americans closer together through free and independent journalism, music, politics, culture, and so much more. The NPR network. What you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org slash network. Hey, it's Lori Lizarraga from Code Switch, the race and identity podcast from NPR. I'm one of thousands of NPR network voices at more than 200 local newsrooms across the country, working to bring people together through our free and independent journalism, music, and so much more. The NPR network. What you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org slash network. 
I saw this clip. I don't know if you're aware of this because yeah. I don't know. How, I don't know how how tapped in you try to stay to what people are saying about oh, you. Oh, don't tell me. No, no, I don't. But know. there's this clip of you that has been going around on social media. It's a clip of you in costume and in scene in Yentl, directing mm-hmm. the scene between Yentl and Avigdor with the reveal. And Avigdor is yelling. Manny Patinkin's yelling right, and screaming right, and everything. Right, 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 and right. And you are directing. And giving directions to the camera operator. This is my, mine! This is my doing! It was your idea! My, mine! It was your idea! Mine! Yes! This and giving directions to Mandy while yeah, yeah, you yeah, are yeah. acting. And right. I mean, talk to me about how you think about being in those modes and how you think about them. Being an actress first, I would think, you know, why are you stopping? just to powder somebody's nose or fix their hair for a minute. When you're a director, you can control that. I always saw the whole. I never just saw my part. I saw the whole. What is the picture trying to say? You know, how do you tell the story? That was what was interesting to me, not just being an actress. I've been thinking a lot about your directing career and how it fits into you know, more women becoming directors in Hollywood over time, and how people's misperceptions about women can kind of keep us from being Mm -hmm. able to reach our fullest potential or from Mm -hmm, even being mm -hmm. seen properly and clearly Mm -hmm, by other people. mm -hmm. You mentioned that so many people associate you with diva-dom. (laughs) Diva-dom. Yes. That's funny. That's not who I am. What is that about people that want to believe that? Maybe they're projecting their own wishes? That actually is the question that I have. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about your career and you directed, Mm -hmm. acted with, or were friends with, Mm -hmm. or were admired by many of the male icons in Hollywood across eras, Marlon Brando, Omar Sharif, William Wyler, Robert Redford. And, you know, they are, were all hard workers, exacting, talented, high standards, but you're the person who's remembered as the diva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. They may have been divas too. I don't know. You might know better than me. But that name only sticks to women. And I know that you've been asked before. Wow. No, that's that's perceptive. Yeah. I mean, I know you've been asked before why someone might say that about you. But I want to know that question that you're getting at. I want to know what does our culture get out of placing that diva stereotype onto successful women? I think there's a I don't know if I talked about this in my book, about my theory about the caveman. I think you did put it in the book. Oh, good. I thought, why are men sometimes frightened by a woman's power? And I just came up with this image of the caveman before language. You know, they hump each other, whatever. She gets pregnant. There's no Mm -hmm. word for pregnant. He has to be totally blown away by that that she can reproduce life. But also, if she could give life, she could take it away, perhaps. And uh, it's a fear, a fear of women and Hmm. the awe of women. Hmm. I see your legacy as a producer and director when I look at an artist like Beyonce, who through Mm -hmm. her company, Parkwood Entertainment, has funded, Mm -hmm. produced, Mm -hmm. and directed multiple films, similar to what you've done with Barwood Films, your production company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all know about your influence on the industry as a performer. But I wonder, how do you see your influence on the entertainment industry as a businesswoman? Mm. I I don't think I do, really. It was only sort of expressions of, I just never thought about really the business aspect. I just thought about it from the control aspect. That is something that came up again and again and again in the book. I think the end of one chapter just said, you know, I have to be in control. I'm a director. That's right. The first time I got a contract, again, I wanted to be an actress, so it Mm -hmm. didn't matter to me if I got a record contract to sing. My manager, Marty Ehrlichman, who became my manager when I was 19. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he brought Columbia Records down to see me. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to sign me. I said to Marty, I don't care what I get paid. I I just want to be able to control my work. Mm -hmm. What songs I sing? What's the cover of the album look like? 
what are the details? I have to control that at the time. What is that, 60 years ago, I think? They were suggesting I call my album Sweet and Saucy Streisand. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? And probably yes. wanted a picture uh, of me smiling on the cover. Mm -hmm. I never used to smile much in those days, but <laughs> I wanted to control that. And I got that. You know, I was able to call my album the Barbara Streisand album because I said, that's what it is. If they see me on television, it's the girl that was on television. And I think her name was, I don't know, funny. Saucy. Way. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? And so I was able to have that. You see, that's what was important to me. It's control. Control of my work. There was another album. I never liked to be photographed and uh, take it. I never liked to have pictures taken and album covers. So I had had some extra pictures left over from a photographer that took me to the beach in Chicago when I was yes. 18. And uh, I said, you know, let me see the pictures and so forth. And I thought later on when I needed an album cover for People, mm -hmm. the album People, I said, here, let's use this picture of my back. I was just looking at the ocean. It's amazing how emotions can figure into a flat piece of paper. Hmm. You know, the photograph, if it's right, captures the emotion, I feel, even on your back. Hmm. And I said, that's the cover I'd like. And they said, you can't do that. You can't have a picture of your back. You know, it won't sell. Yeah. Whatever. I said, well, that's the picture I want. And it became a Grammy Award winning cover. You say all this about control. I wonder, do you see this book as a form of control over your legacy? Yes. Like, like something like the <laughs> ultimate director's cut of your life. <laughs> very well said. Very well put. <laughs> yeah, it is. I got one more question I want to yeah. ask you. There is this a 1991 interview. Yeah. On 60 Minutes, you're talking to Mike Wallace. Mm. We don't have to get into that because that could be a whole conversation in and of itself. <laughs> itself. Just, just that interview. <laughs> but there's this moment. Mm. I was watching it, rewatching it recently. And there's this moment in a conversation where you look back on your performance with Judy Garland on TV in 1963. Mm -hmm. Oh, get your trouble. Happy day. Come on, get happy. I hear again. Mm -hmm. And you're remembering how surprised you were that Judy's hands were shaking with nerves right. when she right. held your hand. And you said that you didn't understand her fear at the time. But right. in 91 at 48, in your late 40s, you understood mm -hmm. Judy was afraid of falling out of public favor, of being forgotten, becoming obsolete. It's like going, going out after being in the business 30 years you know, it's like everybody's ready to say she's going downhill or her career is over or they want it to be over. Not the public, mind you. And so you right. seem to be processing and understanding Judy's perspective and that fear at the time in that interview in 1991. But now you're 81 and your book doesn't have any of that anxiety. Really? You seem pleased with your life. Why do you think it took me so long to write it? Ten hmm. years because I have that same anxiety. Hmm. You know, I, I do. I understand. I understand what she was shaking about. I didn't understand it when I was 21. Right. And I think she was about 42, almost double my age. Right. And I loved her. I didn't grow up knowing her, knowing her work. Hmm. But we became friends and her vulnerability, you know, I became like her in a sense, Vulner very, well, I... You mean vulnerable <sighs> over time? You mean you became vulnerable in that way over time? Over time, over more vulnerable even than I was, yeah. You know, the fear of forgetting the words, not being able to sing till there was such a thing as teleprompters. <laughs> the fear of letting down the audience, was I good enough? Was my voice good enough? Was... <laughs> I just had to do concerts because I had, you know, I had to pay the rent. Right. And my flowers and, you know, live the way I wanted to live. But uh, I never really enjoyed 
performing after a certain time. I wonder, though, like, you know, your book, you said it took a while to write, and you waited yeah. so long to write it. But your book, in reading it, especially in the, late, in the later chapters, and even in your reflections earlier on, you seem so pleased with your life. I wonder, what shifted between 48 and 81 <laughs> that got you to this place of contentment? Well, finding the right partner, hmm. my husband, you know, because men were afraid of me too. I think it takes a strong man to say to me, I'm taking you home. <laughs> I was like, huh? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I, I read in the book the, the, the night you met your husband. <laughs> Right. He said, you're done working for the day. <laughs> I'm coming over. We're going to talk. <laughs> I know. I, I, mean, had... I, I can see how a partner is part of it. But I mean, within you, what shifted? I'm trying to get some, I'm trying to get some secrets, some advice, some what's, <laughs> what's to come. Like what, what change within you happened between, between those two points in time that got you to the point where you feel this contentment and you were ready to look back in this way? Yeah. I wasn't ready for the longest time. I thought I had more to do. Hmm. But then I came to a point where I think what I did was enough. And then you say, you know, okay, let me just live my life. Let me see what that is, you know? Well, Ms. Streisand, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure to have you. Oh, you're, you're such a wonderful interviewer. Thank you. Thank no, you. Really, you're very warm and uh, very easy to talk to. You're my first interview. You're a busy woman. So glad we could get on your schedule. But Ms. Streisand, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you. Yes. I really appreciate you. Thanks again to Barbara Streisand. Her memoir, My Name is Barbara, is out now. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Barton Girdwood, Alexis Williams, Liam McBain, Corey Antonio Rose. This episode was edited by Jessica Placek, Bilal Qureshi. Engineering support came from Patrick Murray, Maggie Luthar. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. Our senior VP of programming is Anya Grundman. All right, that's all for this episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. Talk soon. Science is not just for the PhDs of the world. It's for everyone. On the Shortwave podcast, we dig into the latest news with a humorous touch, all in under 15 minutes. We might not take ourselves seriously, but we take science very seriously. Listen now to the Shortwave podcast from NPR. Hey there, it's Susan Davis from the NPR Politics Podcast. I'm one of thousands of NPR network voices coming to you from over 200 local newsrooms across the country. We bring all Americans closer together through free and independent journalism, as well as music, politics, culture, and so much more. The NPR Network, what you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org slash network. Hey, it's Manoush Zamarodi from NPR's TED Radio Hour. I am one of thousands of NPR network voices coming to you from over 200 local newsrooms across the country. We bring all Americans closer through free and independent journalism, music, politics, culture, and so much more. The NPR network, what you hear changes everything. Learn more at npr.org slash network.